Welcome to Alto Insights. Today with us, we have June Bellamy, a South African whistleblower who bravely spoke out in 2017, as well as Jacqueline Garrick from the United States and the author of The Psychosocial Impacts of Whistleblower Retaliation, Shattering Employee Resilience and Workplace Promise. Yes. Welcome, yes. ladies. It's a pleasure happening here. Thank you for having us. Okay, so let us start off. June, what made you blow the whistle initially? And has it affected your life at all? Um, it's a question that everybody always asks us. Uh, so to answer the first uh, portion of that, um, I can say this. Um, so Samsung has a uh, zero tolerance policy in their uh, works, workspace. We trained on it every year. And I noticed some anomalies, uh, anomalies um, with, within the service division when I transferred into that division, uh, notably around um, the director. And uh, that is, so it was in that scope that I spoke out in, in that environment. So I still have ongoing legal cases about it, so I don't speak too much into that. But um, so there were numerous breaches in policies and a couple of other things that I noticed. And that's when I approached um, the auditors. So they have an internal auditing system and they also have a confidential hotline. Um, and that's when I spoke out about that. Um, the, the thing that's um, interesting to note here though is it's not so much you know the speaking out about it, it was how quickly the retaliation happened. So my identity mm -hmm. was leaked within a week mm -hmm. um, and the targeting and retaliation started it nearly immediately. Wow. And, on, and that's common. And in wow. seeking out assistance, going back to them, can you help me? What's going on? I'm being targeted. I spent another year in that space getting zero support from anybody that I reached out to. Wow. So it affected you personally and professionally. Very much so. So, and when you're in it, um, you don't realize what's going on, what's happening to you. You know, this is not, this is, you know, nobody teaches you about these things. Mm -hmm. And this is common in corporate companies. They will go through the whistleblowing policy. This is what you do. With them, it was like a two-day training. If you notice something, say something, zero tolerance, mm -hmm. we'll protect you. Uh, these are the channels that you can use and all the rest of it. But the fundamental failure is that um, the policies are in place, mm -hmm. but they fail to follow their own policies. Mm -hmm. Notably, if you're speaking out about something um, and what you've raised is actually something they don't want to be known to the public, they will always choose profit over people. And that's where they threw me under the bus to cover up for the director that was doing uh, other items for them, um, which I only found out in about 2019. So when you're in that space, the, and this is where, why this book is so relevant, I was totally oblivious to all of the toxic tactics that were being perpetrated on me. And when Jackie approached me to contribute, you know, she gave me the headings and said, can you give me examples of you know, any of these? And I gave her examples of every one of them. Wow. But right. when you're in it, you don't know it. Yes. Um, Jackie, I see you're agreeing to many yeah. of these <laughs> items. So what inspired you to compile this book and, and what does it contain for the readers? So I'm a whistleblower myself um, with the US government at the Department of Defense at the Pentagon over suicide prevention funding, made a disclosure and quickly my life and the trajectory of my career changed rather quickly. So, and I had spent most of my career working with veterans who have been traumatized in combat zones and were very suicidal. So I had those experiences in, my, in the back of my mind when it occurred to me that what happens to combat vets and what happens to whistleblowers in a hostile work environment, they're doing battle, they're combating for their life, it's a fight, it's very adversarial, there's that betrayal, there's um, that sense of being held captive, you can't speak out, you're being um, gaslit, uh, mobbed, shunned. And so when I started to look at what were some of these tactics, could we quantify them 
that's when I came up with those nine domains, the toxic tactics of retaliation that I call them. Mm -hmm. And I, I started to outline them one by one so that we could start to have common language. Yes. And I think that's been really important because I just came back from the UK where we've worked on this bill mm -hmm. and we've looked at what is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, yes. mm -hmm. and how is this affecting British citizens yes. as well. And when they go through retaliation, we have to have this common language because mm -hmm. just like combat trauma, it doesn't matter the uniform mm -hmm. you're wearing, it transcends country and culture mm -hmm. that when people go through this emotional abuse, they suffer this duress, mm -hmm. they're going to have this impact to their psychosocial well-being. So before we look at uh, tactics of retaliation. Mm -hmm. What you're saying now is, is very interesting and it's quite scary. Mm -hmm. So you would then say the experiences a whistleblower goes through is similar to what somebody in combat goes through. Exactly. Yes. Yes, because of the, the emotional reactions to the shattered worldviews are very similar. Mm -hmm. So when we think of combat, that's, you, know, you think of the physicality of the death and the destruction, but what really imprints on their traumatic memories are the things that cause them the most internalized harm. Mm -hmm. So it's the change in the neurobiology in the brain, the mm -hmm. belief brain, um, as uh, Jennifer Frazier calls it. And we begin to see where this moral injury, which we talk a lot about in combat vets, is very much about having that sense of ethical dissonance. Mm -hmm. So you think you know something about the world, you think you're in a safe place, you think you have leadership that you trust, and then things fall apart. Mm -hmm. And for the whistleblower, it becomes much more personal because the attack isn't just some random strange enemy who has been shooting at you, mm -hmm. um, which is not to minimize that at all, but it is as equally scary to be gaslit, to be told you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. This is your fault. You started this. If you say anything, you know, the whole hospital system will close down and then the whole community loses the hospital. Yes. Or if you close the nuclear plant, we all, the whole community loses energy. Mm -hmm. But the whistleblower is saying, but we have, we have sick patients. We have people who are dying. Mm -hmm. We have contamination in the water. People are drinking that water. Yes. So, that's the first sense of trauma, is you know that there's harm being done and you can't prevent it. The second harm is the retaliation. Yes. And that's where that insult to injury happens. Mm -hmm. Of course, right? Because it's not only in that instance, but as you rightly said, June, subsequent to you blowing the whistle, mm -hmm. it just kept on coming back to you in different forms. That's right. And that's where we mm -hmm. step into institutional betrayal. Because, and this, is, and this only came up recently through Jackie, and I, I reached out to Jackie because there was no psychological support. And in, in my world, you know, there was, there was no family support, there's no spouse support, partner, or anything like that. So I've gone through this journey fundamentally by myself. So I've had to scramble and reach out and um, look for support. And there was nothing locally at the time. So when you're talking about the institutional betrayal, so my battlefield, in a sense, became the corporate space mm -hmm. because I've been in corporates a lot of my life and here you were, you know, you came diligently, you know, you, you're proud of the brand and then overnight you are completely betrayed. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that you can go to, because as a whistleblower, remember, you, you're trying to stay anonymous. So you can't run around to HR and go, help me, help me. Um, and as the time went on, though, um, this is where I've also learned, you know, because I was studying, luckily for me, um, I was studying mindful-based interventions. So I have a post-grad certification in that through Stellenbosch University. Mm -hmm. And that was a serendipitous journey because it walked me through, literally, week by week, new things were happening. And I could drop into, I became more aware. But at the same time, and um, retrospectively, I also know now that I was living in a state of fight and appease. Mm -hmm. So you're going into your corporate space that was safe and secure, you've got friends, you enjoy your job, but now you know, a week in, now I'm stepping into a space that I know when this director is coming towards me, I know that he knows. 
but everybody's got this, this smile mm -hmm. in the face. But then you also start seeing the overloading of work and the gaslighting starting to creep in. Mm -hmm. And the retaliation was immediate. And it was, it was um, uh, supported by HR. So that's where you go, okay, now there's nobody yes. I can trust. Mm -hmm. And um, in that state of fight and appease, your, your, your brain, your neurological brain is going, right, I have to fight for my job, but I have to appease as well, but I have to fight for survival. Mm -hmm. So you're in this push and pull the entire time. And that creates a whole mess of neuros in your neuro pathways Absolutely. in your brain. Absolutely, getting these mixed messages, and then you have this profound sense of isolation, mm -hmm. ostracization, and nobody can support you. Correct. Um, so I'm curious, Jackie. You mentioned about in the book you have these uh, different forms of retaliation. Would you care to give some examples? What do they look like? What do people look out for? Sure. So as we we've already mentioned, give the gaslighting. Um, the mobbing, knowing that there are um, others who are now going to start colluding against you. Um, June called it ostracizing. In the book, we refer to it as shunning. But it's that same feeling of isolation and being banished from the crowd. Um, the You just mentioned the double binding, the mixed messages. That's what happens. The, um, the counter accusing the DARVO, the deny, attack, reverse victim and offender, um, the bullying the, the um, devaluing and the marginalizing. So you're not only on paper being told, oh, you're not, you're not as good a performer as you once were before the whistleblowing, you've had great performance evaluations, but not so great after. You get moved, either physically moved to another space or moved to another office. Um, I got moved from my um, executive office to what had been uh, like a broom closet. There were trash bags that were burning. Um, it just moved you around so that it, it offsets your sense of balance. Yes. And that's where this um, neurobiological implications that uh, June also mentioned in the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mm -hmm. that we look at in the literature that we started to look at in the book because then those toxic tactics cause you to have a reaction, a response, a psychological one, a physical one, mm -hmm. and then there's also this shattering to your socioeconomic status because you're involved in these court cases and your life is upside down. And it's stressful going yeah, to it's court very cases. Stressful. You know, we would equate court cases mm -hmm. with criminality, mm -hmm. and here you have gone wanting to do something good and that is being held against you. Um, you mentioned fawning. So we're used to hearing fight, flight, freeze, and fawning. Is the fawning what you mentioned, appeasement? The appease, yes. yes. So, and, and in that state, um, because it, they, they're such extremes, you know, and uh, you're, there's a phenomenal book called uh, The Body Keeps the Score by Basil van der Kolk. <laughs> and your body is keeping store, score of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you're arriving at work, and you know that as soon as you step through that door, what's going to happen? And that is a daily state that I was in because I was simply on the 1st of June and I was dismissed on the 6th of June a year later. So, and at the time, I, I thought, you know, well, I've always been a strong person, mentally, physically, I can do this. And, but I had no idea of the PTSD that I was going to enjoy, uh, in, endure. And that also only manifests later on. So, um, as an example now, because in a workspace environment. So even thinking about applying for a job after I was dismissed, my brain would just shut down. I mm -hmm. couldn't even go there. I, I, I cringe, I, I, you know, because for me it's hierarchy structure mm -hmm. and it was the hierarchy structure that absolutely um, uh, threw me to the wolves. Right. And as an example, you know, one of the attorneys, I did, a, I did a, um, an assessment, I'd reached out about 130 times throughout the process, systematically working the food, you know, up the food chain to the president uh, of Samsung at the time, Mr. Sang Yun, and through all of this, there was just nothing. There was so, just nothing. So can I bring that yes. back though to the book mm. and the, the research? Because I think that's the, the really important point that I want to make today is when we talk about those retaliation tactics, when we talk about those kinds of reactions, those kinds of reactions lead to symptomatology that we can document. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, we use the diagnostic 
Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Now we have a text. Yes, the yes. DSM. Um, I can. What I've done is I've looked at. So how does gaslighting change your your psychological abilities? Mm. And that's where some of that brain chemistry is altered because you then do things like have nightmares, intrusive thoughts because of the ruminating. So you're constantly thinking about something. So you're having these intrusive thoughts. You're having nightmares about the perpetrators, about the situation. You wake up in a cold sweat. That's how you know something's a real and nightmare. And physical symptoms? Yes. What effects do you have physically? So, and then once you can see the symptoms at, of a stress-related disorder, then you can also start seeing things like migraine headaches, um, gastrointestinal problems. We've seen autoimmune diseases related to increases in stress, as well as some cancer. There's some really new yeah. cutting edge research out there now that makes the link between PTSD and cancer. And I've worked with um, a doctor actually back in the States who was a whistleblower who's been through this and he now has a cancer diagnosis. And so he has shared a lot of that research that we have put in the book because we feel like we need to pull the string through mm -hmm. because ultimately what I feel is the next important step is then how do we make employers, whether governments or corporates that retaliate against people, mm -hmm. how do we hold them accountable for the harm caused and how do we then measure the pain and suffering damages and I've created this whistleblower retaliation checklist Yes. that can give you that severity score and that index. And is that in the book? The, so the book is the research that supports the whistleblower retaliation checklist. We're going to make the checklist available online through our Whistleblowers of America website. Okay, and please do share it with us once that is available, I so that we could also will. make it available <laughs> to the listeners and readers yeah. and those that follow. And just quick tangible examples. I never used to have migraines throughout my life. When I stepped into this environment, they I was uh, and I have a very robust timeline of my uh, mental health and physical health deterioration mm -hmm. in the space of that year. Um, I was I was tracking them. I was getting migraines every four to six weeks. Um, they got so bad. I went to see a neurologist. I thought I was going to have a stroke. We did an MRI, and he said to me, "It is pure stress." Mm -hmm. Now, after the fact, and this is also three four years later. Because of everything that's happening, because I've got all these court cases, I'm financially decimated. At one point, I was estranged from my family. There's no, there's no, there's no community. There's no support. I am now. Um, I had now had hypertension. That's heart attack stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and the again with you know with my mindfulness training, the stress physically shortens your life. There's ample scientific evidence of that. What's not quantifiable is by how much. But the, the, the telomeres that shorten when you, when you are stressed, if you then, you know, rehabilitate yourself and step out of the environment, they can grow back. But it's guaranteed that my life has been shortened mm -hmm. due to the amount of stress, the fact that I'm now in the hypertension zone, I'm on medication, yes. and that just doesn't go away. Because what it sounds like, I mean, you've gone through this process you have your PTSD, you have been retaliated against, and yes, you can come back to a form of rehabilitation, but you need a supportive ecosystem. Mm -hmm. right. So now, speaking of ecosystems, mm -hmm. we are sitting in South Africa. Uh, you blew the whistle in 2017, June. Now, mm -hmm. in South Africa, our context, those years, and even now, are tremendous years for South Africa, dealing with corruption, maladministration, mm -hmm and um, coming to light with state capture if it were not for whistleblowers we would not have known and we wouldn't have been starting to see some effects of civil society coming together yeah. now based on your experience june mm. would you do it again um what is your advice to people that want to blow the whistle in order to improve things um it's a it's a very um it's a very full-bodied question to ask, would you do it again? Mm -hmm. So, yes, we do it again. And I also say to people openly, honestly, you know, shout out to Samsung if you're listening. Mm -hmm. I am still in that process because new evidence has come out and there's going to be other steps taken in, different, in a different area. So, yes, I would do it again. 
But the advice I would say to people is very basic stuff because back then, you know, when you're in it, you know nothing. Mm. Um, go and read your company policies. Then there's not that many often. So go and read your company policies and make yourself familiar with them. I had luckily read them uh, when I first got in there on the advice of the CCMA many years ago. And you get an understanding of what can and can't be done. So when they try to bully you into poor performance and HR is not there, you can go, hold on, where's HR? You know, and then they sort of backpedal. So know what's, know your company policies. Um, we are very lucky now to have the Whistleblower House in place, which opened up last year. And I'll tell you, this is the first month that after they receive from some funding, I have now received three months of basic funding from them. So we're now talking for three months, I'm stable with food, rent, electricity, mm -hmm. paying my levies, petrol. Mm -hmm. So that is nearly six years and I can breathe for three months. You still got the banks coming for your property, your cars, and they're bullying you. But um, Whistleblower House, please reach out to them, contact them. Other civil societies, ACM mm -hmm. is in place. You know, without a, you, you've got, you focus on um, the, 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 the state, cap, well, the state owned enterprises. Yeah. So there's enough civil societies out there to reach out and then they can guide you. The other things is, you know, you, know, you, you have to get enough evidence um, and when you approach the attorneys, but that's where, and we had a, a meeting with them just yesterday, they have got attorneys that are in place now that if you approach them, they can now guide you better. Mm -hmm. So we never had any of that in place. Um, and even people saying, you know, that they're mentally strong and all the rest of it, it's going to affect you in ways that you, are, you will not fathom. Mm -hmm. Your community and your family. Um, and, and so the reason that I'm here, yes. mm. because I'm obviously not a South African, um, this accent probably gives me away as an American, but I believe that we as whistleblowers can uplift each other globally. Mm. So I've been doing this work in the US. I've connected with whistleblowers in actually about 15 countries at this point. Mm -hmm. We just spent a week in the UK for Whistleblower Awareness Week because of legislation and things that are going through parliament over there. They're hoping to create an office of the whistleblower. So when we compare across countries and we see this universality of this common phenomenon, we believe that if as groups, whether it's Whistleblowers UK, Whistleblowers of America, Whistleblower House, that if we join forces together and uplift this, we can do a better job together helping each nation have better whistleblower laws, but also enforcement strategies. Mm -hmm. Because the piece of paper is is no good. It's got to have, it can't be a paper tiger. It has to have yes. real teeth. Absolutely. And we see that here. Yeah, we are great at policies and legislation mm -hmm. and framework. The mm -hmm. problem comes to enforcement. And right. um, I agree with you, June. That's why it's so important locally or, or nationally, at least in our country and across different countries to have these collaborative networks that we could reach out to. As you said, Whistleblower House. Mm -hmm. Alta has got Wispley, which is also a platform. Oh, yes. So the, that's funny, because the the founder of Wispley is on our board. Yes. For Whistleblowers oh, of America. Well, so they're not doing that either. Yes, yeah. now you can yeah. tell them, because we use Wispley. So mm -hmm. um, we do have other sites, like Whistleblower mm -hmm. South Africa, that people can go and blow the whistle. Mm -hmm. um, but then through Alta as well, due to our involvement in different other See, projects. We're, we're connected and we don't even know it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, speaking about the connection, you are here, you've got this book, it's just been launched now, three months. Yes. Uh, where can interested readers, students, lecturers, where can they find this book? So it's available through Springer Nature, which is the publisher. It's probably on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, there's some discount codes I'm going to share with June, so hopefully we can, we can get that out. And then um, the other books that I have are, on, are available through our website at www.whistleblowersofamerica.org. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think we will get the information mm -hmm. and then we will also make it available on Altos website, which should also then boost uh, visibility across the different platforms. Yeah, yeah. And they're inviting you know, big business, corporates, to purchase because it is pricey. It's US dollar based. It is an education yeah. book. Um, so we're inviting them to reach out to us, purchase and donate it to the universities, mm -hmm. even in their own spaces. And if you are in the academia space, 
through the Springer Education site, it is the, it is a massively reduced discount. Mm. So varsities have got access to it because if you have a whistleblowing policy in place, you need to understand the consequences mm. in this book is vital. And then also to understand friends or family members or colleagues that have gone through this and how to treat them appropriately. Yeah. Um, June, quickly, mm. where to from here? So this is the thing. Um, this is one hat that I wear. And uh, I, luckily, like I say, I was studying mindfulness at the time. Um, I knew that if I can't affect as much change at the top, and I will be in the space for uh, many years to come with the uh, connections, collaborations we, we've made recently with overseas and the support um, that has been put into place to lecture on this, to roll this out, you know, um, mm -hmm. with CBD points. But the other thing that I'm stepping into now is early childhood development using the C learning curriculum, which is free, but it speaks to social, emotional, ethical learning. So your EQ is more important than your IQ, and they specifically had to adjust it and bring in ethical learning over the past couple of years. Also, it's done through Emory University, and that could slot very nicely into the LO hour, the life orientation. Mm. So it'll speak to, ethics is one thing, but if you're not self-aware, you can't make skillful choices um, and then you reduce your bullying in school, your um, attention and resilience increases. And then when you step into the workspace, if you've gone through C learning in that 10 year, 12 year space, when you're coming into the corporate space and you start seeing things, you can make more skillful choices mm -hmm. and hopefully not go down the unethical route. Yes, yes. And, and, and be more well, resilient. Exactly. Yes. Ethics, you know, going, you know, uh, corruption is easy. Doing the right thing is hard. Wow. I, I think on that note, I mean, for the organization on doing tax abuse, right? It's um, we are here to do the right thing and absolutely ethically um, and to hold those that corrupt um, to account mm -hmm. because that essentially comes back to our duties and our responsibilities as being active citizens. Exactly. So we use the giraffe as our mascot for Whistleblowers of America. We give out a giraffe award yes. because whistleblowers stand tall and stick their necks out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you one of our giraffes. Oh, this is lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I mean, of course, proudly African and exactly. South yeah, African. They... So uh, we will definitely have a spot for this in Alta and it will balance out our color scheme with this giraffe. <laughs> Thank you color. so much. Thank you and, for having us. Um, we will be very happy to host you again, share your information, you. because we need to collaborate more on the topic of whistleblowers. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you.